Spirit now for our call to worship. Let us worship the living God, the eternal one who creates and sustains us. We raise our voice and praise. Let us worship the risen Christ, the incarnate one through whom God was revealed. We raise our voice and let us worship the Divine Spirit, the Holy One who renews and strengthens us. We will worship the Triune God. Let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Holy Holy.
glorious place. God, our Creator, you sent the Word made flesh to reveal your love for the world and your Spirit to breathe us and lead us into new life. Through their presence and work among us, we come to know the mystery of your own life, a life lived in and through relationships of mutual love. Open our eyes this day to see your presence in one another. Open our hearts to practice the same love for one another. Through Christ we pray. So, how you all doing? Hi, Gretchen. You're right. Yeah. Hi, Cadence. Harriet. Oh my gosh. All right. So, um, so today is Trinity Sunday. Good luck with that. Um, it's, what is the Trinity? I mean, do you know the men, do you do you know the members of the Trinity? Do you know the names for the members of the Trinity? That's a hard question. That's like a college question. So. We think of God the Creator, right? That's that's one, right? We think of Jesus, God the Son. That's two, right? What's the last one? God the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, there are three members of the Trinity. Now that's really confusing because we also believe in one God, right? Just one God. How is that possible? That's just a total mystery. Nobody really understands that. But here's maybe one way to think about it. What do I have here? That's an egg, right? How many eggs do I have here? Just one. That's exactly right. One egg. You can see it for yourself with your own eyes. Oh, 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 oh. Um, all right. So, but even an egg has mysteries inside. Let's take a look. What happens if I do this? Oh. It cracks, right? And then what happens? We can take the shell off. I'm gonna do the whole thing, and that takes a while. But enough that you can see the inside. So what's on the outside? Shell. And then what? There's a yolk. And what else? The, hmm, the white. Right? You can see the white right there, right? So there's a shell. And there's white around the yolk, that yellow part. That's the one called the white, the egg. And then there's the yolk, the yellow part. How many eggs do I have? Just the one. But what's it made of? Three different things, right? The shell, the white, and the yolk. Three in one. How about that? All right. Let's have a prayer together. Oh God, on this day that we celebrate and reflect on the nature, on your nature, the nature of the Trinity, the one God, three in one, one in three, we ask you to open our minds and our hearts to understand the, this mystery, to understand that you exist, even you, God, to exist in relationships of mutual love. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Creator, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Help us understand what that might mean for us and for you and for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, as we prepare to, as I just said, reflect on perhaps the deepest mystery in the Christian faith, let us pray. Oh God, as we prepare to hear these words read and proclaimed, as we prepare to ponder and contemplate your very nature, open our eyes, our minds, our hearts, our ears, 
by your Holy Spirit to hear your voice, to hear your truth. And by that truth, please set us free to love. Amen. So now, on Trinity Sunday, a reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. You're thinking, the Hebrew Scriptures really on Trinity Sunday? Hold that thought. <laughs> now, hear God's word for you this day. Listen for that word. From Genesis 1-1. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God, a breath from God, swept over the face of the waters. The Spirit of God is another way to translate that. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness God called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much. So for Trinity Sunday, I have for you today a sermon in three parts. I know. What a shock. <laughs> Part one. I had a conversation this week with a member of the Warren Wilson College staff. It's one I've been having off and on since I first arrived here in July of 2005. It was about, the conversation was about, focused on religious intolerance on campus, how it's safer to identify as Jewish or Muslim or queer or trans or atheist or anarchist and all of those are present on campus, than it is students who identify in those ways, than it is to identify openly and honestly and publicly as a student who, of Christian faith. On one hand, the conversation is, as you can imagine, probably feel this yourself, on one hand, it's deeply frustrating and more, also, more than a little ironic. Warren Wilson College, of course, prides itself on its commitment to diversity as, uh, and is known as a place where everyone, everyone is welcome. A place where students who've been closeted around their identity can come out and safely and freely be who they are, whatever and whoever that might be. Except that claim is not necessarily true for Christian students. It's not always safe for them to be who they are to be open about their faith, to practice their faith, to be open about it and, and what it means to them. Parenthetically, I would imagine that conservative students who identify as Republican, and there are some on campus, uh, often feel this same uneasiness about coming out as being more politically conservative than the vast majority of the student body. So what's perhaps even more ironic about all of this is that the college's, the college's most prestigious awards and scholarships, the Pfaff Cup, the Sullivan Award, the Bonner Scholarship, these are frequently won and awarded to uh, Christian students. So 16 years into this job and I remain frustrated that students who otherwise would perhaps worship with us might feel reluctant to do so for fear of outing themselves. But it's frustrating in the other direction too. Here's what I mean by that. Students who feel antipathy or who are not sympathetic to the Christian faith graduate with a degree from a four-year liberal arts college without ever having their biases challenged, without having been pushed to examine their stereotypes, without even realizing that the bias on this point, that the bias they are carrying around is rooted in, deeply rooted in a stereotype, without being aware that the recipients of this stereotype find it just as unwelcome as an African American student or Asian American student, Native American, Latin American student, or a queer student might, if they were subjected to public stereotyping, either in the classroom 
or in their dorm room. Like it's somehow okay to mock a Christian student, or at least the Christian faith, when you would never dream of doing that about the Buddhist faith, or about a disabled student, say, about a queer student, any student who's different from the majority of the student body. Students also leave here without coming to understand the role that faith leaders have played in the ongoing struggle, struggles, struggle, ongoing, it's I think one struggle for civil rights and women's rights and gay rights. Faith leaders of all stripes have been involved in this struggle, of course, rabbis, um, imams, of course they've been involved as well, but Christian faith leaders have often been on the tip of this spear, the leading, the front end of this effort to win these rights. Names like the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, all the way up to the current day, Reverend Dr. William Barber. Just this week, a classmate of mine from Princeton Seminary, the Reverend Mac Schaefer, published an op-ed in People magazine on this very topic, detailing why his faith calls him to advocate for equality for trans Americans. This piece was inspired by his daughter, Hunter Schaefer. If you are under 25, there aren't many of us who might not recognize Hunter's name, but if you are a, um, a, a young person in America today, there's a, a chance you'll know her name because Hunter is the star of the breakout hit TV show, Euphoria, on HBO. She also happens to be trans. So a Presbyterian minister coming out publicly in People Magazine, no less, in support of the rights, in support of rights and protections for trans people, on the grounds that his daughter is just as beloved by God as you and I are. I would like students on campus to know this. I think they might be surprised. It's important to note that, and I, I truly mean this, it's important to note that President Morton is committed to broadening the dialogue on campus around these kinds of issues, around faith identity and, and political identity, and challenging these pervasive stereotypes. And I believe that she and her staff, including Tachi and Brian Ammons when he was here, Shannon Spencer, the new chaplain, they're all working on this, and I believe they are making progress, but it's slow work and hard work. So on one hand, this stereotyping, this stereotyping is frustrating, disappointing, but on the other hand, it's also understandable. It's also not restricted to students here at Warren Wilson College, it must be said. Animosity toward Christians, evangelical Christians in particular, has become pervasive in our culture. If I were completely honest with you, I'd have to confess I sometimes feel some of that animosity myself, struggling to overcome that to be perfectly honest. In fairness, there are many reasons for this animosity toward evangelicals in particular, most obviously because evangelical, just the word, the idea, has become synonymous with a weird blending of extremist right-wing politics, fundamentalist theology, white nationalist ideology, and a host of kooky conspiracy theories easily demonstrably false, easily so. So maybe it's right to feel some animosity or some concern about that anyway, at least the public expression of those views. But the root problem of this kind of pervasive suspicion or animosity of, toward Christian people um, might go back further than this, than current events. The root of it might be found right here in Genesis, in the story I read a moment ago, or at least the full story that I read, from which I read a moment ago. In her book, Why Religion, Elaine Pagels writes rather scathingly about the damage Genesis can do when it's read literally as a scientist, scientific text, for example, or as a primer on gender identity and human sexuality. And you can easily see her point in the story. Eve is clothing free, let's say, and she's living in paradise. She eats an apple offered to her by a talking snake. 
and immediately she and her husband grow ashamed of their nakedness. They are promptly driven out of paradise forever, casting a shadow on Eve's gender and over human sexuality in general. Ms. Pagel's point is that a creation story written somewhere around the Bronze Age must be read carefully and thoughtfully and understood for what it is and for what it's not. Because if you don't read it carefully and understand it for what it is and for what it's not, it can indeed cause tremendous harm. Reading Genesis for answers to scientific questions is akin to reading Alice in Wonderland for instructions on how to fly a 747. It's just not what it's for. Genesis is a story, it's not a textbook. It's meant to illuminate the human condition and to tell the truth about it. Not scientific truth, but theological truth. Not historical truth, but existential truth. Not empirical truth, but the enduring truth of the human experience and the human condition. And the story starts in chaos. The story starts in chaos. Note how the NRSV translates chapter 1, verse 1. Many of us knew, memorized the King James Version. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the NRSV adds a, just a bit of nuance, and it's important. And it's faithful to the original. In the beginning, when? In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep. In Genesis, chaos, darkness was the raw material out of which God made the world and everything in it. Why does this matter? Why even still read Genesis? How might a story that originated sometime around an oral myth, really, a story that originated in the Bronze Age, sometime around the Bronze Age, how might that still be relevant today? Well, I'm going to answer that with another question. What if the creation of which Genesis speaks is not a one-time event, but an ongoing process? one that happens more or less constantly. I say this because, as I'm sure you've noticed, the world seems, our country anyway, seems, the world in general really, but our country in particular, seems particularly chaotic right now. We've had protests in our streets, a violent interrupt, insurrection in our capital, shouting matches are breaking out in grocery stores and hardware stores and on airplanes. Fist fights are breaking out at baseball games and not amongst the players, amongst the fans. This, none of this really ever used to happen before. All of this disruption and chaos is scary and unnerving, but I actually think that this too might be understandable. But it takes a second to get there to understand why it might be understandable. Part two. On Memorial Day weekend, we remember those veterans, not veterans in general, but more specifically those veterans who gave their life for their country. In most cases, they did so defending or protecting an America they believed in, a country they believed to be great, a beacon of freedom and democracy shining for all the world to see, worth protecting, worth defending. We're grateful for their service and we commemorate their sacrifice because we, most of us, believe in that America too, or at least we want to believe in it. But there is another side to the story of this country. It's one that most folks who look like us, most folks who look like me, rarely consider often because this version of American history is rarely taught in public schools. And in the version that's taught in public schools, people who look like me, who look like us, are the stars of the story. But it's a story and a history 
that African Americans and Native Americans and other people of color, Af Asian Americans, Latin Americans, have always known. And now, that's that story, the story known by people of color, to people of color, experienced by them, this is suddenly changing and becoming more widely known. Michael Gerson is a columnist for the Washington Post. In a recent column, he reflected on his experience reading a new book called The Broken Heart of America. The Broken Heart of America by Walter Johnson, a historian at Harvard University. It's just one of a slew of new books that are devoted to telling the full story of American history, illuminating the part of it that has remained in the shadows untold for too long. The book first notes that St. Louis is the gateway to the American West. Its arches are an icon of America's progress, of our westward expansion. But both as Michael Gerson and Walter Johnson note, St. Louis was the junction, quote, the juncture of empire and anti-blackness and the morning star of U.S imperialism, that westward expansion was going into lands that were home to other people already. It was the military base of operations for the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans and of the upper Midwest. It was the home of, a, of vicious lynch mobs and racial redlining. Beneath all the chain changes, Johnson argues, an insistent racial capitalist cleansing. All forced migrations, racial removal, reservations, segregated neighborhoods, genocidal wars, police violence, mass incarceration. All of this is evident in the history of just this one city at the heart of American history. That is really hard news to hear. It's hard news just to say. I really, and I genuinely understand that. I know that ordinarily most folks come to church to hear, not to hear hard news, we come to hear good news. And again, I understand this very well. That's certainly the news I prefer to preach, the news I prefer to hear myself. But I'd also like to think that we come to church to hear the truth, even if it is sometimes hard to hear. And I say this because I believe we are not, America is not going to live into its promise without a reckoning around this truth. Part three, and we're, trust me, we're rounding third and we're heading for home at this point. All of this brings us to Trinity Sunday. It is, I admit, an odd choice to preach from Genesis on a Sunday ordinarily given to considering the triune nature of the God of our faith. I don't have a theory about how God interacts with, intervenes in, or shapes history. And anyone who does insist that they know how God does these things is not being straight with you or with themselves because nobody understands or knows how God does those things, how God takes chaos and shapes it into something beautiful, something wondrous, something as wondrous as the cosmos or as beautiful as earth itself. And I don't know how God might take the present chaos and darkness and disruption we're experiencing here in the U.S. and turn it into something beautiful and wondrous and make our country more orderly and beautiful in the process. We've seen those cycles play out in the past, the disruption and chaos of the 60s, giving way to the relative tranquility of the 70s. I don't know how that happens, and I don't know God's involvement in it. Nobody does. But here's what I do know. The second person of the Trinity, even Jesus himself, Jesus the Christ, recruited helpers to realize his dream for the world, a dream of God's kingdom, God's realm, God's reign being realized here on earth as it is in heaven. That, too, was slow work, hard work. And he was, in the end, even Jesus was only marginally successful in that work. And we know this because, of course, the work continues into the present moment. And today, 
I also know that today it's going to take a church filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity, to realize the Creator's ongoing dream for the world. A dream where all God's children are loved and treasured and treated equally, where we all have the same rights, the same freedoms, where we are all where we all have enough food to eat, where we all can safely be ourselves, the people God created us to be. And I also know that the story of Pentecost is still true, that God is calling today's church to cross its own boundaries, as the very first church did, to go out into the world, a world filled with different people, different languages, different cultures, to make this love known, to build out this kingdom, this realm on earth as it is in heaven, to show the world what God's love looks like in practice, which is why it is important for us here in our specific context to continue to find ways to cross our own boundaries, to find ways to make what we believe inside our sanctuary visible outside our doors, to show the students, faculty, and staff on this campus what it means and what it looks like to be a person of faith. Christian faith has taught preached and practiced by its founder. If we don't, how will they ever know? This I know to be true. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the source of all life, wholeness, and love. I believe that God is revealed in Jesus Christ. I believe that in his life, Jesus reveals God in grace, mercy, forgiveness, and justice. I believe that in his death, Jesus reveals God's determined presence in the world, even in the face of hatred, violence, and pain. I believe that in his resurrection, Jesus reveals God calling us to abundant life, both now and forever. Life beyond our fearful and fragile imaginations. I believe that God lives among us, within us, and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God moves us to be together in communities of faith, hope, and love. I believe these things not out of certainty, but out of faith, as one who trusts in the reality of the triune God.
say, friends, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as you go, may the grace of the Creator God be with you. The pre sorry, the grace of the risen Christ be with you. The presence of the Creator God support, surround, and sustain you. And the peace, love, power, and joy of the Holy Spirit fill you today and every day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.